we are almost done. We'll hear, we uh, have two more keynotes, uh, one from Marvika, uh, the executive director of uh, um, Digital IC Hub, and then the closing note from Mr. Ho moon Hyuk, the president of uh, uh, Judicial Policy Research Institute of uh, the Supreme Court of Korea. So you're here one at a time. Hi, everyone. It's been a long day, and I'm going to try and not make it any longer. Um, so I'm not doing slides, um, also because I hadn't prepared any, so that helps. Um, I just wanted to wrap up things. Um, and this is a very, very simple point, but I wanted to reinforce it because it, it sort of still amazes me. Um, amidst all this focus on making AI transparent, opening up black boxes, even amongst our own community of people you would think are insiders into this AI conversation, people who work with AI, who are creating it, building the tools, interrogating it, critiquing it, thinking about it in so many wonderful different ways, we don't have a common vocabulary ourselves. Half of every conference is spent on even discussing what we're talking about. So I think if I had to come up with an alternative title for this conference, or indeed any AI conference, it would probably be this, you know, the reframing of Haruki Murakami's book, which has now become, you know, code for everything we do, which is what we talk about when we talk about AI. Um, and I think today we've added a few more layers to that, a few more chapters to that book, what we talk about when we talk about ethics, what we talk about when we talk about safety, what we talk about when we talk about transparency. And I think the fact that these are very, very abstract, ambiguous concepts, yet they're things that are being implemented by machines and systems and code is, there's a huge cognitive dissonance there between the abstract and the concrete, as has been pointed out earlier. And I think that's something that's uh, really, really interesting to me that we're still at that space, yet we're so alarmist and panic-stricken about all the ways in which AI is going to you know, change and transform our lives. Um, there's been a lot of great work done on demystifying this field, on making it accessible. I mean, we have tons of academic articles and research papers uh, and books, Peter's new book, um, which are wonderful, but we've also got great thematic primers, like those that Madeline and others have worked on for the AI Now conference. Um, we've got games, you know, the gamification of everything, like MIT's Moral Machine, where you can sort of really play with the trolley problem if you haven't had enough of it. Um, we've got amazing art. People are using machine learning, using neural networks to actually generate and create art. You know, wh whether it's the kind of art that moves us to tears is still something we're waiting to see. But, you know, AI is writing symphonies. It's creating paintings. Um, it's sort of reframing how we create, what we think the act of production and creativity and cultural production is. But it's also art that investigates sort of the future and thinks about what's the impact of AI? What are we creating? What, and that's why I sort of wanted to call this Imagine Futures. Like, what is this world that we're imagining um, with whether it's co-opted by AI, through it, enabled by it, whether we're in the driving seat, whether the machines are, um, thinking through all of those issues. So we wanted to have this conference, uh, Digital Asia Hub, with all of our partners because we felt that a lot of the conversation focuses on sort of two ends of the spectrum. It's either this completely dystopian, oh my God, you know, it's going to take all our jobs, killer robots are going to kill everyone, it's the end of humanity as we know it, that's the sort of dark side or the light side, depending on where you stand on these things. But there's also this whole utopian, techno-utopian sort of fantasy that AI will solve every problem. And I think this is an extension of what we've seen with something like big data, where given enough data, we can solve problems. And I think AI sort of amplifies um, and exacerbates that tendency you know, towards quantification and sorting, saying, if we just had the right labels, the right categories, enough data, out there, we could make sense of the whole universe. And I think we wanted to sort of be somewhere in the middle saying, there are good and bad sides to both of these things. And like, what does the gray look like? Because I, I find gray much more interesting than black and white. And um, I think that's really where we can see new things emerging. So we really want to help play a role in capacity building about you know, uh, pushing this conversation to people who are going to be affected by it, but are not necessarily thinking about it because we didn't ask them. The people who are going to be most affected by AI, like with most things that modern technology brings about, are the ones who are least involved in this conversation. 
Uh, we're guilty of that too in this room. We're not asking villagers and farmers, you know, contract laborers, people who are going to be displaced and disrupted. They're not in this room telling us what they think because when we don't understand it ourselves, how on earth do we expect them to? So to some extent, I'm not guilty of that. I sort of feel that we have to play a translation function. We have to bridge and convene and speak for people who don't necessarily have the ability, the agency, the ability to participate in these discussions or who could even understand the implications even if we were to explain it to them. So I think I'm really sad that Frederica couldn't participate because she was gonna talk about the limits of transparency and fairness, you know, what, what, what the boundaries of those are. So I think from my perspective, what I would be really happy about, like, and I would love to extend Urs's conversation about what is the role, not just of the university, but of the larger community of, of all of us, of academics, technologists, social scientists, artists, um, end users. I think we don't put end users into the picture enough. So what does this, this community of practice as well as community of scholarship, how do we help actually unearth the big questions and actually help solve some of them? Um, there's been a lot of talk with big data about big data due process. There's been talk about review boards, about ethics, and I think that's something we can also bring to the AI conversation, and you know, people have touched upon it in different ways. Maybe that's another way in which the university can play a convening and an independent function. Um, what are the lessons we've learned about you know, bias and discrimination that have come from the big data world that we can sort of extend and say, this is only going to be made worse by AI, and these are the things we need to guard against. Um, who needs to be in this conversation? You know, as I already said, like, are we hearing from the people who are the most marginalized who are going to be the most affected? Um, finally, I, I'm a privacy lawyer, you know, and I, I care about human rights and freedom in, in sort of the broadest imagination of those two terms which often means that I end up spending a lot of time with people who are, you know, doom and gloom vendors and merchants are always worried about everything that could go wrong. But I also work with technology and startups and all the enabling things it can do. So I'm also surrounded by hippie trippy people, millennials who think they really are genuinely changing the world one dating app at a time, which is wonderful, you know, and I sort of sit between these two people. And so given that I live both personally and professionally between these sort of, um, color extremes, if you like, you know, the black and white. Um, I want to actually reframe this binary that we've been talking about for myself. So it's not just what we talk about when we talk about AI, but I think for me, it's what do I worry about when I worry about AI? And those, I think the, the few points I will share with you is I worry about consolidation. I worry about standard setting by insiders and industry leaders. What room does that leave for the smaller players who might actually be coming up with the most creative and exciting and sexy developments in this field? Um, is it going to be a monopoly? Is it going to be a cartel? What you know, sort of role can we play in making sure that doesn't happen? I worry about research going underground. Um, I worry that this golden age of everything being open and interoperable and open source and open data and you know, let, let's throw enough data sets at it. At some point are we going to think machine learning has had enough data sets to learn from it and can all go underground and become the secret sauce and become proprietary? Um, I also worry about something that Madeline brought up which was about efficiency being the sort of driving goal. Um, is that the only metric that we're going to use or are we going to sort of construct this around more um, social constraints. So um, I would just say that in addition to the what do I worry about when I worry about AI, I would also like to leave some space as instead of the, you know, I do believe, like what do I hope for when I hope um, for a future with AI? And I think my biggest hope, and I'm doing this to keep it short, is that in interrogating and questioning and worrying about the sort of chain reaction and the unpredictability and inscrutability of what we're dealing with, and the fact that at some fundamental level we really genuinely don't understand a lot of this, um, and it's a sort of Silicon Valley mindset of, oh, we'll try it and we'll work it out and we'll like rejig and tweak it in real time, which might work for certain, you know, closed systems, but with this kind of a, you know, test tube fission kind of thing, maybe that analogy doesn't work. Maybe the beta testing model doesn't work. So I think what I uh, really hope for above everything else is that the worries, the harms, and the risks will actually trigger a really essential conversation about what it means to be human. And I think if it takes a machine for us to remind ourselves as a race, as a society, as you know, different communities of practice and scholarship 
of what we really care about, which essential elements of humanity do we want to preserve and not outsource to a machine, I think we've come a little further along in our quest towards being fair, egalitarian, and just. Thank you. Hi, 본래 지난주에 오기로 돼 있었던 중국 최고인민법원 대표단이 일정을 변경을 해서 오늘 갑자기 온다고 하는 바람에 할수 없이 제가 하려던 환영사 대신에 지금 이 클로징 노트를 하게 돼서 이 프로그램을 바꿀 수밖에 없게 만든 것에 대해서 먼저 양해 말씀을 드리겠습니다. 그리고 제가 오늘 여기 와서 보고 갑자기 든 생각이 어, 우리가 오늘 하루 종일 AI에 관해서 공부를 하고 토론을 에, 했습니다. 그런데 한국은 지금 또 다른 이것과는 전혀 다른 또 다른 AI 때문에 한국 농촌이 대단히 고생을 하고 있습니다. 바로 조류독감, 어, 에이비안 인플루엔자 에, 그것 때문에 한국 농촌이 많은 피해를 입고 있는데 가만 생각해 보니까 혹시 이 AI가, AI가 아주 잘 발달을 해서 저쪽 AI도 예방을 하고 고칠 수 있으면 얼마나 좋을까 아, 그런 생각을 했습니다. 예, 그 저기 준비된 이 클로징 노트를 말씀드리겠습니다. On behalf of the Judicial Policy Research Institute, I would like to thank all of you for your participation. In this wonderful workshop, which has been successful in presenting the current issues related to the development of artificial intelligence. We felt that artificial intelligence is just around the corner. This year, AlphaGo beat a famous Go champion, Isedol, and IBM Watson for oncology began to identify treatment options in order to help physicians develop individualized cancer care in Gachan University Medical Center. I found that uh, today's discussions about safety, ethics, regulation, law, and uh, societal impact uh, with artificial intelligence are more thought-provoking for me uh, than uh, cutting edge technologies like Tesla's autonomous car. I really want to talk about AI further. However, uh, as you know, traditionally, the most important function of closing addresses is not giving a boring lecture to tired participants, but giving brief thanks to the contributors before a great dinner. I would like to uh, express special thanks uh, to Professor Urs Gesser of uh, Bergman Klein Center for Internet and Society, Malavika uh, Jiaram of Digital Asia Hub, Professor Kim Jae-wan of Korea University Legal Research Institute, OpenNet Korea Artificial uh, Research Institute, and the Software Policy and the Research Institute, and all of the part, uh, prominent speakers, presenters, and respondents for the excellent organization of this workshop. Also, I am grateful to Professor Park kyung uh, He has uh, devotedly engaged himself in the planning and the execution of this workshop and contributed immensely to the program. Thank you again for your participation and attendance at this workshop. On behalf of, of JPRI, 
I wish you and your families good health and a fulfilling happy new year. I also hope you enjoy the rest of this evening. Thank you.